Welcome back. Today is August the 6th, 2023. Josh Jordan gives a message entitled, God's Response to Our Waiting. Alright guys, I'm going ahead and start us on up. Good to see everybody tonight. It's a wonderful Sunday night. Not too hot, definitely not cold, just just right. Hope everybody's got their coffee. Makes life a little bit better when you wake up and it's like, man, what's the point of being alive? Get a cup of coffee. Make you feel better. You know, my uh, sermon tonight is entitled, God's Response to Our Waiting. And it's interesting because I studied uh, some German philosophers and some Swiss philosophers, and one of the big discussions is, is life worth living? And a lot of them said, no, the best thing that can happen to you is never to be born. And the second best thing to happen is to die soon. And that's the philosophers. They sit around thinking about life so much they don't want to live it anymore. Uh, yeah, it's sad, but then you had some good ones. You had some good ones. Um, you had the... Um, Swiss psychoanalyst Dr. Carl Jung, and he went through a lot of strange periods in his life, but toward the end of his life, he, he found the Holy Spirit, and he said, if you want restoration in your soul, if you want to be a full person, you need to look at the living image of Jesus Christ. I thought, wow, so there was some, a lot of life, and a lot of these German philosophers and Swiss, Austrian, they were trying to find what's the meaning of life, what's the point of even being around, what's the point of anything? And some of them, like Nietzsche, found the opposite of the meaning of life. They found something else down there on their inner journey. And then you had some of them, like Dr. Jung, who at the end of his life, somebody said, hey, do you believe in God? And he kind of got shocked and he said, what do you mean believe in God? I know God. And so at the end of his life, the man found God. It's online. You can look it up on YouTube. He was 86 year old. You know, I don't believe in God. I know God. You know, the man found God because he realized there's something inside of me that's given me life, and this has to be God because it can't be anything else. And so the man found God through his inner journey. And that's why our inner journey is so important because when you go down and, and, and say, God, what's, what's my motives? What's happening inside of me? You know, it's important to find that answer. Um, I'm trying to think of the passage. I think it's in Hebrews. It says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow. And like Don says, it's not a marijuana joint. And able to (laughs) define the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the word goes down inside of you. David says, Let your truth be made known in my inner man. And so that word goes down inside of you, and you can either follow him down in there, or you can just be a surface person for the rest of your life. But God calls you to go down there and see what your motives are, because maybe you're living a, trying to live a good life out of wrong motives. But God calls you to go down there because he says, love me with all your heart. That's our commandment. And he also says, you will find me if you search for me with all your heart. Now, there might be parts of your heart you don't want God to see. Like Peter said, Lord, don't be in this boat with me. Let me get out of this boat. I don't want to be around you. I'm a dirty man. I'm a bad man. Get away from me, Lord. And there's part of our heart that is going to say that when it sees the Lord's glory. (laughs) You see yourself. You're no longer just seeing yourself, you know, through a shadow. You're seeing yourself in God's light. And it's like, Lord, get away from me, man. What are you doing hanging around me? I'm a dirty man. You know, the Pharisee, the religious man, says, thank God I'm not like that man. But the true inner man says, no, I am like that man. Except for God's grace, that's exactly how I would be. And we realize we, are just, we can just be just like that man. Uh, Daniel and I got to minister to someone coming off of crack cocaine in Brazil. And, you know, I was crying because I saw how, how this man was a, a Christian and a minister and he had a bad slip up and he was going down a bad path. And I was crying. I said, man, if God wouldn't have saved me, I'd be in the same shoes you're in right now. And you're not a bad man. You're under too much pressure. And so you're going back to your old life. First of all, you need to, you need to get this pressure off of you. Because as long as that pressure is here, you're going to go back to something. It may not be cocaine. It may be something else. But you're always going to go back to an addiction. 
And that's why we have to wait for the Lord. Because as we look over and over and over in Scripture, we see two types of systems. We see the system of Babylon and the system of the New Jerusalem. And Scripture always talks about this, you know, Jerusalem or Babylon, the New Jerusalem, the heavenly city, or Babylon. And that Babylon, it really represents all the negative, all the, the worldly way of thinking, the earthly way of doing things, the earthly way of, of doing business, of, of ripping people off, of being part of a system that's godless. And we see it over and over and over. And God wants to work that Babylon out of us so we can complete his will. And that's why I'm talking today about the inner journey and about these different philosophers because they went down inside of themselves. You know, one of them, if you guys, I, I'm sure all of you guys have heard of Nietzsche. Has anyone not heard of Frederick Nietzsche in here except for Olivia? Okay, everybody knows who Nietzsche is. He's the famous man that said God is dead. And that's how most of us know him. But we don't know why he said God is dead. And I've been able to study some of his stuff and I saw a documentary. It was very, very interesting. Why did this guy turn against God? And so Nietzsche, he grew up in a, in a town, a beautiful town in Switzerland. His dad was a pastor. He went to school to study theology. But his dad died when he was five years old. So already his heart is like, God, why did you take my dad away? And then he goes to study theology. And he becomes colder and colder and colder. And a lot of things happen. He starts denying God, believing he doesn't exist. He was sick all his life. He'd go days in the bed. He was always struggling with something, always alone. And then if that wasn't enough, he meets this beautiful girl, and he says, hey, would you marry me? And she says, no, but how about me and your um, partner in philosophy and you all get together? And he said, okay, that sounds great. So he has this other guy as a third will, and then that other guy takes this girl he's in love with and leaves him. And so he's all alone again. And so then he writes his next book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And then all this stuff, uh, God is dead, we've killed him. And all the pain and the anger comes out. And it's so interesting because he goes on this inner journey and he goes down there into those unconscious realms. But instead of waiting and seeing God in that inner man, he sees the inner man without God. And what that looks like is the willpower, the same thing that eventually made its way to Hitler, you know, a few decades or whatever later. And so Nietzsche starts seeing this thing of willpower. Here it is. I found, I found God. It's the Ubermensch. It's the Superman. I am the Superman. And he really believes this stuff. So Nietzsche begins to preach against weakness. And see, that's what Babylon does. The only thing about Nietzsche is he found it out, and he began to preach it like it was the gospel. He, pro he preached against weakness. Christianity is a weak religion. It sees crippled people. It wants to help them out. It sees poor people. It wants to give them money. It sees people that's sick. It just keeps them on, just keeps them sustaining. It's a weak religion. It's a bad religion. We need to get over human compassion. We need to be the Superman. We need to find strength. And yet he was the exact opposite of what he was preaching. He was a weak man. And he preached and preached and preached against weakness about finding the Superman and what happens in the end of his life, there's a little bit of him left that's still human. And he can't even stand his own message. And he gets so sad one day that he sees a horse that's being beat up and it's, it's exhausted. And he goes and he hugs the horse. This is a, a philosopher. He, he goes and he hugs a horse. And after he hugs the horse, that's the last sane thing that he can do. After that, he collapses and he's insane for 11 years insane and if you see pictures of him online he looks crazy he lost his mind he's a vegetable for 11 years and see that's what that kind of philosophy does you're bearing something in you that you have to become your own god and that's uh that's what dr jung said about nietzsche he said yes the man went down into those unknown parts but he didn't have an anchor he didn't have a rock he lost he lost that grasp of what reality even was he forgot what it was to be alive to really be a human and Nietzsche preached against humanity. It was crazy. And so he became crazy. He became crazy for a long time. And he would even sign letters to people as Dionysius. Or he would sign, I'm the crucified one. And see, he had to become his own God because he rejected God. And that was a lot of pressure for him. He even tried to rewrite the morals of, of, 
of morality. He said, the transvaluation of all things. I'm the first great human being. I've created the earth. Here's, the, here's how to be a good human. And he went crazy. And so if you don't look for God, if you don't wait for God, it's all about you. And that anxiety is going to come inside of you. And you're going to have to be your own God. And Nietzsche was an example of that. And I hope maybe during those 11 years of being a vegetable that God was able to deal with him. I really do. But you'll have to be an example of that, carrying all that weight. And we can't be God. And Dr. Jung lived a long time, up until his 80s. And he was a healthy man. He was a happy man. He found joy. He made a lot of mistakes during his life. But he found something important. He said, look, there is a stone inside of me, and I don't understand it. I can't tell you everything about it, but it grows stronger and stronger every day. And I know there's a God. And if anybody really wants to be a whole man, they have to admit there's a God. Because to admit there's no, no God, you, you're going to be crazy. You're going to have to be your own God. There is nothing that can replace the Heavenly Father in, in this world. There's nothing that can replace that. If you want love, if you want to be restored, you have to believe in something greater than yourself, greater than your own ego. And, and you have to realize you're made in God's image. If there's no God, you can't even believe that. And then everything's about you creating your own world, and it's too much pressure to bear. And so that's the, that's the God that Dr. Jung found. And I, I studied him a lot because of World War II history and just seeing, wow, look how this man was really the red flag saying, guys, watch out for this Adolf Hitler guy. He's not a good man. Because at that time, what did Adolf Hitler do? He went to church. He, he, you can see all these pictures of him standing in the church door, shaking hands with these cardinals, with these priests, saying, a vote for me is a vote for Christian culture. But he never said a vote for me is a vote for Jesus. He said Christian culture because it was all about culture. He was playing people. His best, one of his best friends at that time was a Christian, and he was trying so hard to turn Adolf Hitler into a positive light. He said, man, you got to stop hanging around these racist people, man. They are not good. They're going to bring you down. you got to stop going on with these crazy theories about race and about the air, and you got to stop that stuff, man. It's not good for you. But he, Hitler would always preach Christian culture, and people believed him because they knew deep down inside something was wrong, but they didn't want to go find out and search what, what was wrong with it. Um, one of the people in, in Hitler's life was an architect, and the guy was planning on building a dome in Berlin the size of the pyramids in Egypt. And the guy thought, man, this guy Hitler is so, so incredible. And so what happens the day they start building this magnificent dome, which would make anything else look like nothing, the day that, that happens, World War II begins. And now this guy is no longer an architect. He's Hitler's arms munition guy, and he's designing tanks, and he's designing factories to build planes and submarines. And the guy is so like, man, let's get this war over so I can do what I want to do. And he's so sad, and, and finally he says, look, because he, he got uh, caught, he went to prison, and he said, look, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was, and I didn't want to know what it was. And one of my friends told me, hey, there's some camps out there. If you get the chance to go visit it, don't. Believe me, you do not want to know what's going on. You stick to your stuff, man. Don't even ask any questions. And so people knew something was wrong, but they didn't want to admit it. As long as they didn't have to go down there and say, I'm going to investigate what's wrong. I'm going to investigate what's happening. Then everything's okay, because I can just sit here and go to church and sing praise and, and be a good Christian, whatever that means. I don't want to face reality. And see, that's what happens. We want to face a fantasy. Why, why does it say in Jeremiah, it says, my prophets prophesy falsely, my priests rule on their own authority, and this is exactly what my people want. Why would anybody want the prophet to prophesy falsely? Why would they want the priests to rule on their own authority? Because they don't want to have to deal with themselves. They don't want to have to deal with God. The priests are saying, peace, peace. The priests are saying, don't worry, no, nothing's going to come to you. And yet, that's what the people wanted because they didn't want a real relationship with God. Because if you have a real relationship with God, it's scary. It's incredible. It'll make you happier than anything in this world can make you. But you have to be open, and people are afraid to be open. And so people choose the fantasy. They choose to believe a lie instead of coming to the truth. They don't want to wait. They don't want to wait for God because they're scared. And why? 
because they don't know what's going to happen. It's interesting. In Peter, it says, don't be surprised when strange things happen to you or strange trials come upon you. You know, a lot of times we get attacked as children or even attacks, you know, when we're a teenager because God knows our purpose, but, but the devil does too. And so often when you're young, you're going to be hit at your greatest strength. You know, me, I was a creative kid. I think my, my mom is here. She did a good job uh, nurturing my creativity, you know, encouraging me to, to create things, to, to, to draw, to make uh, film scripts, whatever. And that was really nurtured in me. But I went to school, and I couldn't work very well. I'd always get distracted. I'd get called stupid. And, you know, God really had to deal with that in me. He said, Josh, why are you better at these people? Why did you take Why did you listen to what they said? Why did you take it? Why did you listen to it? And I listened to it because I thought, man, this is a Christian environment. It's a Christian school. You know, if a Christian teacher says I'm stupid, I must be stupid. You know, and I didn't realize, hey, this person's probably just having a bad day. I wasn't a grown man, and so I didn't have that type of uh, thinking process. But I just thought, man, I must be an idiot. And so what happened? I didn't wait for God anymore. If something happened, I just responded on my own strength. And God did show up for me at that school. I had a great wrestling coach that helped me believe in myself. You know, I had a lot of help. I had a lot of good things happen. But I didn't like to wait for God because I thought, man, God, you let this happen. You let this happen. You let this happen. You let this happen. I'm not waiting for you anymore. Uh, Even Adolf Hitler said, hey, don't sit around and pray and wait for God to do something. He's waiting for you to get up and move. This is how you should pray. Dear Lord, bless my weapons. He literally said that, and people literally listened to him. God's waiting for you to do something. That was his message. And guys, it's hard to wait for God because the Babylon in us doesn't want to wait. If we're not, if we don't have money, we want to do something to get money. You know, if we can't do something to get money, we want to take somebody else's money. If somebody slaps our face, we want to slap them back. You know, I'm a pastor. I'm a minister. If someone slaps my face, I'd like, God, please give me the strength not to slap them back because I don't know what would happen. You know, it would just hit me real fast. It'd be, God, help me, help me, help me, help me. But it's hard to wait on God because we want revenge. We want our blessing to happen. We want our desire to happen. God has put DNA in our heart. He's put his DNA in our heart. And Jesus always says, you know, what is a temple? We are the temple. Don's talked a lot about the book and, and the scroll. All that DNA is inside of us. So I call that desire. You can call it the scroll. You can call it desire. There's not one person that I can preach a message and it'll hit their life just like everybody else's life. We're all individuals. As the body of the Christ, I have to be my part and you have to be your part. I mean, imagine I'm the finger and it's like, okay, I'm going to be an elbow today. Well, that's not going to work too well. Or, hi hey guys, I'm the mouth. You know, corny joke. But imagine me trying to be something that I'm not. It's not going to work. And that's how God sees us. We have to be the part of the body we are. That's why scripture says, don't forsake your assembling together. Encourage each other. Look, I have my door I have to walk through. I have my destiny, my scroll I have to live. Nobody can live that for me. But you guys can help me. Say, Josh, you're supposed to be writing screenplays. You're supposed to be creative. You're supposed to be doing this and that. Why are you sitting there doing this all night? Why are you sitting there playing video games 24-7 or, you know, whatever? Why are you sitting there trying to figure everybody's problems out? That's more what I do, trying to figure stuff out all the time. I can spend a lot of time doing work that doesn't matter, you know, just because if I'm busy, I feel okay. But God has put a desire in our hearts, and we have to look at that desire. The desires that God puts in our heart, that's a lot like our scroll. You know, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. I think a lot of people see their desire, and they try to do it themselves. It says in Ephesians that the Gentiles make their God their own desires. So God puts that desire there, but you have the opportunity of seeing it and saying, okay, who's going to fulfill this desire? Now I can see what it is. I know what I want to do. You know, I want to be an astronaut or I want to be whatever. I want to be a painter. I want to be a construction worker, whatever. 
I want to get married. Well, who's going to fulfill that desire? Do you trust yourself to do it or do you trust God? And when that desire becomes your God, then, hey, at least you're acknowledging it. But then you're going to have some problems because now your desire has become everything. Okay, I need this, so I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get it. That's what happens when you make your desire your God. You don't trust God anymore. You don't say, God, I know you're going to give me this desire. No, you say, this is my desire, and it's going to get fulfilled. And when someone makes you mad, when someone feels like they're in your way, you just take them out. Look, we have plenty of examples in history. You know, today we have, you know, uh, some, some political figures out there. Some people may actually like them. I, I don't like all of them. I won't mention by name. But there's some pretty bad world leaders out there. And if they don't like you, you're gone. It might be anthrax. It might be the mob. They're going to take you out. They know how to do it. Because, hey, I'm, I'm okay with you as long as you don't get in my way. And what happens, what happens to us when we're young? The Satan is going to hit us where our scroll is. Because when, when you're walking to who you are, you're a threat to somebody. And so what happened to Jesus Christ? Hey, take care, Charles. Good to see you, buddy. What happened to Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ came into the world, and he was trying to be taken out before he was even born. And when he was born, what happened? Jesus was born, and people tried to kill him. He had to move to Egypt. And then the Pharisees. And someone is always trying to kill Jesus Christ because he's a threat to everybody. He's like, you know, especially when he's saying, I am. And if you knew my Father in heaven, well, well you're saying you're God now. And so as long as Jesus is not a threat, no one cares that he's around. It's like, okay, you want to go preach? You want to go heal, heal a broken leg? Go ahead, do it. But the moment that he's saying, hey, my father in heaven, it's like, okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You're saying your father in heaven? Wait, we're the authority here. Now you're coming against us. And see, when we walk in who we are as, as Christ in us, that desire that he's given us and we're holding on to it, we're a threat to somebody. You know, I could tell as a child Every now and then, it just seemed like people were mad at me for no reason. And I wasn't cool enough, or I wasn't whatever enough. I wasn't smart enough. And so I was always like, man, I must be an idiot. And so it's like, I didn't want to be who I was. I didn't want to be that creative kid. I didn't want to be that loving kid. I thought, man, that kid's an idiot. Why was I born like that? I need to be somebody else. I need to be tough, you know? I need to be tough. I need to be mean. I need to be cool. And so it's like, I pushed that part of me away, not realizing that was, that was the God in me suffering because it says don't be surprised when some strange thing happens to you. Look, when people see innocence in you, they're going to kill you. They're going to abuse you. They're going to do whatever they can because you are a threat to them. Something innocent is a threat. Even the Pharisees didn't even like kids. Here comes Jesus into Jerusalem, and he's entering into the city, and the, the, the babies, the, the children are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees are like, make them be quiet. And of course, you know, Christ responds, if these didn't cry out, the rocks would. The Pharisees don't want to see natural reaction because those, those children, just because they're innocence and their humility, they could respond to the glory that was on Christ. They didn't study scripture. They didn't have all the knowledge. But in their spirit and their soul, they knew who Jesus Christ was, and so they naturally responded to him. And, of course, of course, the Pharisees are saying, hey, this isn't good. And the Pharisees even said, man, those poor people that don't know the scriptures, they're following Jesus. Whoa, that's so sad. Can you believe that? They need to study more and be like us, be smart. And that's what the world does. It's going to see the Christ in you and fight against it. And as long as you don't take hold of the Christ in you, you're going to be okay because the world's not going to fight against you. But guess what? If you take hold of the Christ that's inside of you and really be who you are, that world, the religious spirit, is not going to like you. It's going to fight against you. You know, Jesus said, they hated me without a cause. If, if they call me the devil and said I had a demon, guess what? They're going to say the same things to you. And I mean, the Pharisees, the, the, the leaders, the rulers, were saying, this man is a Samaritan and he has a demon. Jesus Christ. And so we know when we take hold of that part of who we are, you know, people aren't going to like that, especially religious people. 
But look, Jesus had a lot of friends. Christ had people hanging around him, prostitutes, uh, probably alcoholics, tax collectors. He had a lot of people that were drawn to him, and yet the religious people were not drawn to him. So what do we do about this desire? Let's look at Gideon. I'm sure probably everybody in here knows about Gideon. But what I think is so interesting about Gideon is he had a really hard time talking to this angel because the angel said, oh, man of valor. And he's like, what? Who, who's that? And then the angel said, you know, I want you to be a leader. I want you, God has this purpose for you. And, and Gideon's like, well, if he does, what's, what's been going on the past 100 years? Why, if God's so great and he has this purpose for us, have all these bad things happen to us? And see, that's what we do. It's like, if God's really f- for me, why did I have this thing happen to me when I was a kid? Why did I grow up poor? Why did, why did I get treated so bad over here? Why has this thing happened to me last month? You know, why, why has all this stuff happened if God's with me? And that's what we say. But then the angel says, you go forth. See, that discontent we have actually is part of who we are. It's actually part of our scroll. We have to step in that place and be the, be the one that fixes it. We can't do it in our own strength, but we can do it in God's strength. I heard a testimony from somebody this week. It was really interesting. She came to Christ because uh, she was a Buddhist, and she, she had people suing her. Christians were suing her. And she said, can they do that in their Bible? And so she opened up the Bible and started reading, and she came to Christ. It was a, a girl named Amy that goes to the Unite Church. And, and I thought, that is so interesting. I told Amy, I said, I should start suing people. Maybe, maybe they'll read the Bible. There's a discontent that we have, and that discontent will actually bring us to Christ if we, if we look into it. See, when you have something bothering you, you need to look into it. It's like if you got that little thorn in your foot or, or, or something, it's like, what, what, is, what is bothering me so bad? Look at it. Get that thing out because just that little thorn can cause a lot of irritation. Now, if God says, hey, I've allowed this uh, in your life for my glory so you won't exalt yourself, sure, but he probably ain't gonna, he's probably going to say, hey, just get the thorn out. This isn't, this isn't me this time. Take that thorn out of you. So like Gideon, we can be that answer. That can, discontent is going to rise up, but we can be that answer. And so there is a journey that happens. People look at the book of Revelation and they think, man, all this stuff, these locusts, these locusts are tanks, it's the Red Army, it's the Russians, it's the Chinese, they're going to come after us. But it really starts in here. And Jesus talks about the new temple. And guys, we're that temple. And that's why it's important that, that as those columns or pillars or, or, or precious stones, that we look at each other and we help call each other to who we are. Because we have to be those individuals but be those individuals together. It's important. But as at Temple, we have a new light source. It's no longer the sun. I mean, Scripture, it's interesting. It says, and I saw the heavenly city coming down. It no longer needs the light of the sun because Jesus Christ, the Lamb, He is the light. And that happens to us. See, we have a way of looking at ourselves. And we can say, oh, this is why this happened. This is why that happened. I think psychologists, psychiatrists can help in a lot of ways, but they can't help you always to see the light of Jesus Christ. They can say, hey, you got a problem because you got some chemistry off in your brain. Here's, here's a pill. And that can help for a while. That can help for a while. But, but when Jesus come, says, hey, here's, here's the problem. You had a demon that was uh, uh, assigned to you when you were five years old. Well, that might change things a little bit. Well, how do I deal with this, God? Well, here's my love. Here's what you look like to me. And see, when we see ourselves in his light and not just the ordinary light, it changes our life. You know, when we see our lives in the light of Christ, it changes our life completely because we have one way of thinking, but it says in Psalm 103, God is in heaven and you are on earth. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And it also says that in Isaiah, our thoughts and his thoughts are two totally different things. So in our rationality, we can do a lot, but we can't walk on the water. We can build a boat. And hey, that's great. I mean, you could probably go faster in the boat than you could walking on water anyways. But maybe sometimes Jesus is calling you to walk on the water. You can't do that in your rational mind. 
You have to do that by your spirit. And it's only the child inside of you that knows how to walk on the water. It's not the grown man. The grown man is the critic. And that's one of the things we really have to deal with to escaping this old system of Babylon. Because like the word says, those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They will rise up on wings with the eagle. They will run and not grow tired, walk and not become weary. When you wait on the Lord, you're going to get that new strength. But the old critic's going to come up and say, hey, that, that's water. That's water, man. You put your foot on that, you're going down. You know, don't believe this guy. You're going to walk on water. What do you have? Some kind of like hover shoes? What is this? And so the critic in you is always going to condemn the, the child in you that's wanting to walk a supernatural life. And I think moving forward, we really have to deal with the inner critic. And we are all our worst inner critic. You know, I, I criticize myself every day, probably once an hour. Man, an idiot, what am I doing? And it's easy. It's so easy to do it. It's so easy to do that. It's so easy. You know, because it's like, man, I got to do something better. I can, I can just try a little harder. Just try a little bit harder. I can, I can do everything I need to do. Ah, why didn't I think of that? You know, I've been de designing these coffee bags for my business. And we've had so many things come up. It's like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I think of that? And see, that's the inner critic. But, but there's a higher, there's a higher, God, what are you saying? Show, show me your light, Father. Show me your light, God. Show me what you look like. Show me your strategy for this situation. And to follow God, we really do have to get over that fear of making mistakes. And that's tough for me. When I leave, when I leave the house, I, I, I check all the doors, make sure they're locked. I make sure all the machines are off. And, and I, check, I always check my car, make sure my, my doors are locked. Sometimes I'll go back to the house a couple times and shake the door. Uh, I, I think uh, last Sunday, I shook the door once, and I got in the car. I was like, man, I don't know. Did, did I shake it hard enough? Did I, is it really locked? Oh, I need, I need to go. No, no, I'm going. Nope, no, nope, I got to get rid of this thought. I'm going to go back. So I go back, and I shake the door. Yeah, it's locked. Okay, I can go. Because you know what happens you do that every week, and then there's always that one week out of the year. Ah, the door was unlocked. Can you believe? I'm so glad. I'm so glad that I choked that lock. If, just imagine if there was a thief walking by and he got into the house. But, you know, as much as I do that, last night I left my wallet in my car, and I had my car unlocked. And I always check that stuff. But I was so tired because I'd only slept a few hours the past couple nights. And I was so exhausted, I had completely forgot. And I was like, oh, my gosh. If there was a thief walking last night, they would have had a fortune. Well, they would have had a bunch of credit cards, not a lot of cash, but they would have had some credit cards. And I thought, you know what? I really do have to trust God because I'm always going to have that day that, that I don't have my mental capacity because I haven't been sleeping, and I'm, I'm tired. And, and I, I have to get over that fear of making mistakes because everybody's going to make mistakes every day. It even says that in the James. We all stumble in many ways. If someone does not stumble in what they say, they're a perfect man. And so people talk about, I don't sin, I don't da-da-da-da. Um, I've heard people talk about uh, being, being sanctified, and, and I'm no longer a sinner. I don't sin anymore. I don't do any willful sins. But that, that's pretty tough, man. If I was around you 24-7, I'd find something. I'd, believe me. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably step on your foot or do something to get you to say something, just so I could, just so I could get you to admit it. But we have, it's impossible to be perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. So how do we bring our whole heart before God? How do we search God with all our heart? We let that light in. Because Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He who hears my voice, I will come in and dine with him. And he's saying that to the church, the church of Laodicea. So he's saying, open up your heart. Here I am. Do you want me to come in or not? But look, he may come to you in a way that you don't want him to come to you. He may come to you through, through a homeless guy. He may come to you through one of your friends that you don't even like or one of your enemies. He may come to you in a vision, and a dream. He may come to you in a form that you don't want to accept him. You know, I think it was Dr. O that talked to, uh, said something about he came into him in the form of the white Jesus and then the Chinese Jesus. And, and he would keep having these visions of Jesus, uh, you know, as a different race. And he's like... God really had to mess with my mind because he was expanding my mind. And one thing about us really following God with our whole heart, we have an inner journey to go through, all of us. And I want to challenge you guys this week. You have to have the inner journey. 
Paul says to Timothy, really pay attention to these things. Look at the gift God's given you. Take pain with it. Look at it. Write it down. Study it. And we all have an inner journey. But as uh, Dr. O even taught us, Dr. Ogbenaya, uh, if you guys don't know, he's a brilliant guy from Nigeria. Uh, he speaks, I don't know how many languages, uh, Hebrew. He studies the Hebrew, the Greek. And one thing he said is you have to have a vessel. And I agree with that 100%. We all are hearing from God every night. In Job, Elihu says God speaks once or twice every night in a vision, in a dream, and yet no man pays attention. We don't hear God a lot of times because we don't want to. We don't want to, like, get up and say, hey, this is what I feel. If you don't remember your dreams, it's okay. Get up and write whatever you feel in the morning. Just write something. Say, God, what are you speaking to me? But you have to have a vessel for your inner journey. I do. I have a screenplay. And everything I go through, I, I compile my dreams together. It's not a lot of work, guys. You could spend 10 minutes. But, but just have a dialogue with God. Say, God, this is my desire. This is what I want. Speak to me in the night. I don't care if it's a journal you have, if you have a little audio thing. Maybe you just draw. Maybe you paint. Maybe you dance. Maybe you worship. You need to have something to keep track of what God is saying to you because, again, I can't walk through your door. You have to walk through your door. I can help you get to that door, but it's so important to look at that inner journey that you're having. What am I dreaming? What are people saying to me when I read the Bible? What scripture sticks out to me? What character in the Bible sticks out to me? See, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be illumined, that you can see all that God has for you. And he wants those eyes in your heart to open up. Because, look, your heart knows what it wants. And you're going to find that scroll inside of you if you let your heart open up. Now, you might try to fulfill that scroll yourself. Maybe, oh, hey, I'm a romantic guy. Let me, let me go find a woman. Match.com. But, but maybe you say, okay, God, I, I, I want a wife. Show me. Or maybe, God, I want, I, want, I want this job. I want to do this. I want to minister in a foreign land. God, show me where to go. But pay attention to what he's saying. Have a vessel, whether you write it down. Just have some way to dialogue with God. Have some way to record what's happening in your life because it makes it a lot easier. If you just record it up here in your head, it's a lot tougher. So do something, but have some way to dialogue and journal or do something to record your life with God. Father, give me this day my deadly bread. He gives us our bread every day. Every day he's speaking to us. But are we writing it down? Are we recording it? Because each of us have a journey. And we, when we find our journeys as an individual, we can find it easier together. We can see, oh, this is your journey, but this is how our roads are intersecting. This is where God's taken us all. And that's what God wants for us. Amen. That's what God wants. He wants us to wait and see what he's doing. Because if we wait and we give that attention, then we'll be able to see, wow, look how he's exalting me. I'm going to uh, end with Isaiah chapter 14. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I will read some. Isaiah chapter 14, starting at verse 1. So to conclude it all, God speaks to us every day. And if we wait for him, we will see what he's speaking. But it's hard to wait because like King Saul, we want to take stuff in our own hands. King Saul was losing his battle. And so it was like, okay, I got to take this in my hands. I have to do a sacrifice. King David knew how to wait. He put on the ephod. He prayed. He said, God, what do I do? And God always gave him an answer. Not in the time he wanted, but he always gave him an, an on-time answer. And David lived to, you know, to be a very successful king. So when we wait, God raises us back up. The system of Babylon will rise up first because people take stuff in their hands. They get stuff done. They get money. They get power. They do what they need to do. And again, studying World War II history, you know, I can see how Babylon works. I will, take, I will take this thing. God's waiting for, for me to, to do something. So I'm going to take this in my own hands. 
Isaiah 14, verse 1. When the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel and settle them in their own land, then strangers will join them and attach themselves to the house of Jacob. The peoples will take them along and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel will possess them as an inheritance in the land of the Lord as male servants and female servants. They will take their uh, captors captive and rule over their oppressors. It's very interesting to see how this happens over and over and over in history. You know, people go out and they conquer. And especially with Israel, they were conquered, but then God always brought them back to their place because it says the meek will inherit the earth. And so God humbles his people, but if we wait on God, he is always going to bring us back up. Now, if we join ourselves to Babylon, we're going to go down with Babylon because Babylon rises fast, but it also falls fast. And one day it's destroyed. And uh, so what happens? Uh, verse 4, you will take up a taunt against the, uh, the king of Babylon. So what happens? The people say, look at this man. Here's the king of Babylon who deceived the, the whole world. He's become weak like us. Where, where is his pomp? Where, where is his strength? And it, it's amazing, Isaiah chapter 14, how much this relates to, to World War II and to Adolf Hitler. Because it says, if you read on, it says, you will not go and be buried in a noble grave with kings. You will be thrown into the streets. And what happens to Hitler? He dies. He, he shoots himself in the head. People put, a, put him in a hole in the street. They put gasoline on him and light him on fire. That's what happened to him. Because he didn't want to go in a, he didn't want to be in a museum. He said, ah, the Russians are going to take me and put me in a museum. Now, some people say he went to Argentina and had a girlfriend. I, I don't believe it. But if you want to believe it, it's okay. But uh, anyhow, most historians will say that, yes, he was buried in the streets. And he, he had his body burned because he didn't want to be in a museum. And he didn't want to be laughed at. That was his big thing. He didn't like to be laughed at. And all this chapter talks about uh, this man, this strong man, how you have fallen. Now, Hitler, nobody thought that he was going to fall. I mean, people looked at him, wow, this man is strong. He's going to win this war. You know, and then the tide started turning. But people were amazed. Look how weak this man is. We thought this man was like a god. He was defeating everybody. Look at him. He's, he's fallen because Babylon cannot stand. It's always going to turn in on itself. People are always going to lose. Even the German soldiers, you know, they started turning against Hitler, his own generals. They said, wait a minute. We're on the wrong side. What's going on here? You know, a lot of his guys started turning against him because they realized we're not serving God. We're serving the devil. What are we doing? We've got to wake up. Um, listen to this in verse uh, 13. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly. In the recesses of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you will be thrust on the Sheol to the recesses of the pit. And that's what that Babylon system says. I will do this. I will do this. There's something in us that doesn't want to wait on the Lord. I'll do this. Hey, I got a problem. I'll take care of it. Oh, I have some bills. I'll go out to get an extra job. I'll do this myself. Me, 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 me. I'll do it. That's the system of Babylon. You know, I can do this. And it attaches itself to other people that think they can do it too. That's the iniquity of Babylon. But, but what happens in the end, like we read earlier, God, I mean, in, in, this, uh, in, in World War II, so God takes the Jewish people and the nation comes together, the nations, and they put them back in their homeland. And then the Nazis lose the war. And it, it, it's, it's like a miracle. It's like, how did God preserve these people and, 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 and bring them back to their own land? And, 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 and this guy, Hitler, was powerful. I mean, he, he, he wasn't that far away from having victory. You know, but God dealt with it. And see, God always deals with that Babylonian system. It looks powerful. It looks like it's the strongest thing in the earth. And for a while it is, but God always comes back. And see, here's people that were persecuted, they were rejected, they were thrown down, and yet God brings them back. He exalts them. But it's, it's, it's something we have to look at. Am I waiting on God to exalt me, or am I going to exalt myself? Am I waiting on God for, to see my desire satisfied? Or am I going to satisfy it myself? 
And the world, I mean, the message of the world of Babylon, I'm going to do these things myself. I don't need to wait on God. But God's message is, no, wait on me. I will exalt you. I will bring you back to this place. And it's funny because the I wills are like those iniquity drives. You know, I'll take care of myself. I'll be like God. I'll be my own righteousness. I'll, I'll preserve my own life. But see, later God, he has his own I wills. When you look later in the, tra- uh, in, in the chapter, he, uh, God says, um, I will destroy your root with famine. I will kill off your su- survivors. And you're seeing God's I wills. I'm going to take, a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a vengeance from my people. You hurt my people, I'll get you. I'm going to get you back. Because God's a just God, and he doesn't let stuff go on and on and on. You know, see, when I was a kid, I thought everything was my fault. It's like, man, I didn't do good. I'm not doing good in school. I'm not doing good at this. I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an idiot. It's my fault. I need to do this more. I need to do this more. I need to do more. And yet, I didn't wait on the Lord. I didn't know how to wait on the Lord. You know, I didn't know how to say, God, what are you saying to me? God, please help me with this. Bring me up. Bring me out of the pit. Because God will, when we wait, when we wait on the Lord, he is always faithful to answer us. And so, guys, I love y'all. It's good to see you guys. And I want you guys to find that scroll in your heart. Find that little book. Find that desire. But take it before God. Find some way this week to contain everything God's saying to you. God, what are you saying to me in my dreams? What are you saying to me in my, who am I? Who is this person to me? How, how is the enemy attacking me? Because the devil is, he's theatrical. He wants you to think that life's about this thing over here when, when it's actually about this thing way over here. You know, he wants you to focus on, am I being a good Christian? Am I doing everything right? So he can preserve that old image. But God wants you to focus on who you are. He wants to focus on your heart. You know, it's so funny. In Germany, people would go to church and talk about, you know, here's what I'm doing to be a good Christian. And yet, they were turning a blind eye to what was really happening, what was really important. And it's like, man, nobody cares if you said a curse word. What are you doing about the, the, the Holocaust that's happening in your own country? There's a lot bigger stuff going on than, than a little word coming out of your mouth, you know? I mean, we got to look at, like, what's God really saying to you? And a lot of these Germans rose up and rose up and said, "Hey, wait a minute! We have a madman as a, as, as a leader, guys. We got to do something about this." And so you had a lot of people turned against them. But at the end of the day, what is the desire God's put in your heart? Who are you? Who are you? When you walk in who you are, yes, the enemy may come against you, but guess what? The heavens are going to open up around you. When Gideon walked in who he was, here's a little man. And he had 300 men, and yet he conquered. He was a warrior. When you step in who you are, nobody can stop you. It's up for yourself, because maybe you don't want that persecution. You know, Jesus says, those that follow me, they'll receive many times in this life, uh, family, farms, but also tribulation. Guess what? The world has tribulation, too. So, I mean, it's, it's part of our walk. But the glory of walking with him, man, how do, how, what beats walking with Jesus? What beats being who you really are? I mean, we live in a world full of people trying to be somebody else. And, you know, like, you know, saying they know who they are and they're trying to be like their favorite uh, rapper or their favorite actor or their favorite, you know, country music star, you know, and they don't really know who they are. They're just trying to be a group, a groupie. But who are you? When you find out who you are, all heaven will support you because scripture says, God supports those heavily whose heart is completely his. So I want to pray for you guys. Just shut your eyes, please. Father, thank you so much for for your word and for your incredible love for us. And I pray that the eyes of our hearts would be illumined tonight, Lord, that you would show us who we really are in you. God, in any part of us that we've rejected, any lie that we've received thinking it's from you god i pray that you would illumine that and take it away from us god we also pray tonight for that inner critic to be silenced lord that you would show us how we criticize the things that you're doing in our life and we would not walk in fear but we would walk in the spirit of wisdom as solomon walked father i ask this for everybody in your holy name jesus if you guys want extra prayer come on up to the front i'd be happy to pray for you come on up